Hey everyone, welcome to the Walk 12 podcast. If you're tuning in on YouTube or any of the podcast directories, make sure to subscribe and hit the follow button because we're bringing on amazing guests all 2023. We have not missed one yet. So without further ado, let's get right into this episode. Todd, for anyone that may not know you, tell us your elevator pitch. You know, who are you and what do you do? My name is Todd Wilson. I do mortgages in California, mostly private money. And I also am a credit expert. I wrote the book, Crack the Credit Code. Amazing. So like, let's get a little bit down into your walk to wealth. I think a great place to start is tell us a little bit about what was money like in your childhood? What was the topic of money and personal finance in your household growing up? And how did that affect you? Yeah, it wasn't really talked about much, except my mom would constantly complain we didn't have money and how everybody (laughs) else was rich, you know? So, So the mindset wasn't particularly encouraging. And it wasn't until I got into working myself and and actually broke through that barrier of not having money till I really Mm -hmm. realized, you know what, it is possible to make good money. Yeah. And at what point did you think, did you hit that, like came to that realization that money is actually obtainable to the vast majority of us, especially if we're in the U S when, well, how did that epiphany occur? Well, actually what happened was we had had our second kid and my wife told me she wasn't going back to work. And so I had to make more money. (laughs) <laughs> and so I was like, uh oh. And so I got a job working for a mortgage broker and I knew nothing about mortgages. I knew nothing about real estate. And so I had to learn from the ground up and I built up to being the highest producer in the office. And so that was really kind of my turning point was getting to that point of going, hey, you know what? You can actually make money doing this. Yeah. And so let me ask you, right, in terms of the topic of credit, at which point in your life did credit come into the conversation? Was it something that you kind of picked up? during your time in the mortgage industry, or is it something that you picked up uh, through the personal side of things? Well, really it's both, but more of a personal side for me because credit when I was broke and I had a kid at home and it's like, I wasn't making enough money. Credit was an issue. Yeah. And, and then getting into the mortgage business, I went to a seminar about credit and I was all jazzed up. I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. I can help my clients so much with this. But what I didn't realize is that I only had a piece of it even from that seminar. And so when everything fell apart in 08, everything crashed for me. I bankruptcy, foreclosure, and I had to figure out how to rebuild from there. And there wasn't a roadmap that I could find to do it. Yeah. So what was, if you don't mind sharing with us, what was that like going through that experience? Because most of my listeners, it's like, we were, I know I was, I think at that time, and not to make you sound old at all, but <laughs> <laughs> right. I think I was in like third grade or so during when that time happened. So it's like, for me, I was also living in a project at that time. So like, we we're already kind of having it rough. So I, I don't remember too much of a difference just from my early childhood, but like, what was it like going through that? Cause now you at this point, you had a family already, right? You were with your wife yeah. and you had a kid, right? So what was it like experience in that time for all of us young folks that probably have I was kind of naive and unaware of what really took place. Or even if we read upon it, we didn't actually experience it fully. So what was that like? It was rough because my income from 2006 to 2007 dropped by 80%. Jeez. And so you're, you're kind of operating based on you're going to make this amount of money forever. And I realized that wasn't the way to do it, but I didn't realize it until it was too late. And yeah. so... It was like, okay, now we got to figure out how we're going to make ends meet. And that's where the bankruptcy and foreclosure came in. And honestly, if I had known what was happening or what would happen, I probably would have done a lot of things different. And I might have not, might not have gotten to where I am now because of that. So in some yeah. senses, I'm kind of glad that I went through that because now I know. Yeah. It is like a bigger loss, bigger gains, right? You have right. to lose a lot to... So that you can gain a lot. Like all the the big people in trading talk about like if you haven't lost your first 100,000 yet or your first 500,000 yet, it's like uh, you haven't played b- at big enough stakes yet. Uh, <laughs> that's a, something I learned from one of the trader guys that I interviewed a while back. It, it, it definitely makes a lot of sense because it's like it shows that you earned your stripes because like you had it and lost it and then found it back. Because a lot of times the people get it the first time, it's a fluke. But it's like getting it back from the ground up really shows that you had it in you the whole, the whole time. And so let me ask you, I know when inside of credit, bankruptcies and foreclosures, they tend to stay in your credit report, right? So like, how were you able to kind of come back from that and start rebuilding your credit from the ground up and rebuilding your life and your business as well from the ground up all kind of at the same time? Well, you actually hit on something there because it's true. I had to rebuild all at the same time because I had left 
the mortgage broker I was working for had yeah. started my own company with a couple of friends. And we started at the worst time ever. I mean, literally June of 2007, as things were, the roller coaster was going downhill fast. <laughs> and so it was like, how do we figure this out at the same time as I'm dealing with this problem? And so getting back to how I came back from it, obviously it was hard work figuring out where to get our investors and how to get loans and how to put them together and set up our business to succeed. You know, and that was, there was a lot of trial and error. I won't lie about it. It wasn't like I knew going in, yeah, this is what it's going to take. Cause if I had, I wouldn't have started it at the time. So yeah. again, I'm really glad I didn't know what it was going to take, but it really came down to on the credit of, I stopped using credit for three years. I just went, that's it. Credit got me in trouble. So I'm not doing it again. And it was yeah. a huge mistake. I actually didn't figure it out until about three years into it. I was like, this is really holding me back because without credit, I can't buy a house. I can't buy a car. I can't even rent a hotel room or rent a car without a lot of trouble. So I had to figure out how to get that first new account and how to rebuild and not make all those same mistakes that I had made and that millions of other people have run into. Yeah. And so let me ask you then, right? A lot of times like people... So Dave Ramsey, not to knock him at all, but he has a lot of solid points in terms of like paying down debt. But like he has a lot of things I also don't agree with when it comes to like absolutely like tearing up all your credit cards and never using them ever. I think credit cards definitely have a lot of benefit. As you say, there's definitely the cars you can buy, the loans, mortgages, stuff like that. How, let me actually, I think to this would be a great segue kind of really into today's conversation is what are some of the common misconceptions around credit and credit cards that people have from your personal experience that are kind of holding them back from building their credit and leveraging their credit? I would say one of the biggest things is actually has to do with credit utilization, which is the percentage of your available credit that you're using. Because most people, when they get a credit card, let's say they have a $5,000 credit card. Yeah. Why can't you use all $5,000 if you need it? But then what happens is now you're at 100% utilization. And it causes your credit score to drop a huge amount. And then you go, well, I, need, I just need more credit. And nobody will give it to you. And I mean, it, it's not something they teach you in school. They should, but they don't. And it really does hold people back to a huge degree. I mean, I, have a, I couldn't tell you how many people have called and say, my credit's perfect, but my scores are low because I use too much of my credit card debt. Sheesh. It's one of those things where I was talking to a teacher one time, and he was saying that a lot of the reason that you know we're not teaching this in school is because the teachers are struggling from the same things that we, we're seeking to learn. So it's like, unless you're in the entrepreneur space or you're on YouTube University, it's kind of hard to come by a lot of this information. And like for me, um, for those who listened to like my earlier episodes, I kind of talked about how I got into credit. So my first credit card was like a Bank of America credit card. And had I known that Bank of America isn't the most, not to knock them, but- Go ahead, uh, it's okay. <laughs> it's the most reputable company. I would have- halted sooner but one thing i did is there's this app and it's called self it's like a pretty much it shows up as an installment loan and you pretty much make monthly payments and at the end of the, the like year you pretty much get majority of your money back minus like i think i paid like 30 bucks in interest but it started reporting on time monthly payments to the credit bureau so that i could start kind of like building my credit because i had absolutely none nor did i have any really real knowledge into credit at all so for people that were kind of like in my shoes and didn't oh, know John, where to you're start. Frozen on you my know, screen. How did you start building your credit up again from going pretty much, I guess, MIA in the credit world for three years? How do you kind of start rebuilding back your credit? And for someone that doesn't have any credit, where do you recommend they start? Well, there's really two ways. And number one is getting a secured credit card, which is simply you put money into a savings account and you get a credit card that is used, that, that savings account is used as security for the credit card. So if you put $300 in your savings account, they give you a $300 credit card. And then you use that card once a month for something you normally pay cash for, whether it's like lunch or a tank of gas or groceries or whatever. And then when your bill comes, you pay the whole thing. That way you pay zero interest. And that's, that's the easiest way to start because you don't have to rely on anybody else to do it. Yeah. Let me ask you a question, right? You said interest. Is interest something that you look at when applying for credit cards? Yes, absolutely. Because now, share your yeah share your opinions about because I have I have different opinions but I, I'll share mine after you share yours. Okay, so you can have huge variations in interest interest rates. Like you could have cards that 
they give you 0% interest for the first 12 or 18 months or something. Or you can have credit cards that are like, hey, we're going to charge you 35%, but they're going to call it 34.99 because it sounds a little bit lower. <laughs> and so if you can avoid paying interest, then obviously you're saving money. Yeah, definitely. For me, I'm very much in the school of thought of if you just paid off in full every month, there's no such thing as interest. That's right. And so <laughs> for me, when I'm looking at credit cards, so I have about seven right now. One with Bank of America. The other six are all with Chase. Four of those are personal cards, two of which are business cards. The business card, although the initial hard inquiry was shown on my credit report, the actual monthly on-time payments don't even apply to my credit. So those and those are kind of in their own category. But like for my personal cards, I try to make sure to pay everything in full every month. And that way, there's never any interest that ever carries on. So like for me, when I'm looking at these different cards, some of the main things that I'm looking at are what's the welcome bonus? What's the minimum yep. that I have to spend within the first X amount of months? How much time do I have to hit those welcome bonuses? And then from there, I usually look at to, into like, what are the, the multipliers and the different cashback rewards and different benefits they offer? And then how could I potentially then stack that with something else to like make it even better? Or so let's say, one card has like three X on gas, but sucks in the grocery store department. I'll complement it with a card that has better incentives and better rewards for a grocery store. That way I can use one for each different place and like really maximize my points back. But that's a little more complex for your everyday consumer. It um, is. You're right. But, but that's, that's actually good. That's a very good point because everybody's going to have their own needs and wants when it comes to credit cards. I yeah. mean, for example, let's say you've got a family now. And you may not have cash to spend to repair a car. It may cost $2,000 to repair the car. Yeah. And a low interest rate is going to be better in that case than one that's, that's like, well, I don't want to pay this off at the end of the month because maybe I don't have the cash to pay it off at the end of the month. Yeah. So having at least one low rate card that has a pretty good credit limit is yeah. a good idea just in case of emergency or if you want to make a purchase for your business yeah, to help not... to help increase your income, which is one of the huge benefits to having credit and having good credit. Yeah. So let me ask you then, what is a good interest rate for cards? Because for me, as I said, I, I don't really look at interest rates. It's like, I'm very naive to this subject, right? To this like particular, I guess, subject within credit, the credit world. What actually is a good interest rate for credit cards? It, there's so much opinion in that question that it's, it's hard to answer. To me, anything that's like right now with interest rates having gone up, if it's below 15%, it's a pretty decent rate. I mean, yeah, you can get lower rate cards and you can get the ones that are 0% for 12 or 18 months, you know. But the one thing to watch out for that kind of counteracts that low interest rate is some of these cards go, yeah, we'll give you a low interest rate. That's a $150 annual fee. Yeah. And you're like, okay, well, that just ate up some of that benefit. So maybe it's not quite a great deal that I thought it was going to be. Yeah, no, definitely. And it's one of those things where there's definitely a time and a place for it. But let me ask you for the cars for annual fees. What's your thoughts there? Because I have a couple myself. But as I said, I'm I'm a little more into like the points and miles game, so it kind of makes sense. But like, well, I want to hear what, what are your honest opinions on annual fee cards and 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 that cards in that I guess category. Well, I like simple, so I'm not gonna I, like your system of keeping track of this card for that, that card <laughs> for this, and, and that sort of thing isn't something that I want to spend my time on. So to me, any card with an annual fee is a no. Yeah. I'm just I'm just not interested. And so what would we recommend? You said a secured card. Is there any like credit cards in particular? I always recommend Discover. Discover to me is a very reputable company from what I've seen. And had I known what I known about credit, I probably would have started off with Discover myself personally in terms of getting my first credit card. But where what was your first card when you were building up credit or where would you recommend people to kinda like to go to get their first credit card? Local credit unions. Because a local credit union is going to be a little bit more lenient because they want to help people that are local to them. That's their actual mission. Yeah. And the interest rates tend to be lower. And because they're easier on credit, if you pay them on time, and this is how, how it transitioned from the secured card to a regular card, I paid them on time for a year. And then I said, hey, guys, can we switch this over to a regular credit card? And by the way, while we're at it, can we raise the credit limit? And they said, okay. I mean, because I paid it every month on time. Yeah. So can you kind of walk us through through us that process a little bit? Because for me, both all yeah, both my 
I guess all my cards are with like big institu- institutionalized banks. So I never really dealt personally with like a a credit union either for banking or for credit purposes. So like walk us through that. What's that like going to a local credit union? What do what are some of the things you have to look out for? Things that you should look for? Green flags, red flags, all that stuff because I'm not really I don't know too much about credit unions. Well, credit union is operates the same as a bank from the point of view of a consumer. Okay. They they have bank accounts, savings accounts, you got mortgages, car loans, credit cards. I mean, all these things exist there. But a credit union, they're dealing with a local community. And when you go into a credit union, you actually join. So you're now a member, which gives you, it's not like you can go in and tell them what to do because you don't own the credit union. You're just, they, they say, well, you're one of the owners, right? Yeah. It's kind of like, like owning a membership to a health club, but it's a little bit more personal than going to, say, a B of A or one of those larger institutions. And because they're local, as I mentioned before, they want to help you and they'll be more lenient on credit than some of these other bigger banks will. And then you're also helping your community as opposed to these big international banks that may or may not have had anything to do with the crash in 08. I won't say anything further. (laughs) That's a good point. Let me ask you, right? How does one prepare themselves mentally for credit cards? Because a lot of us, we were, I got like probably somewhere around here. I could probably, I think I might've thrown them out, honestly, but like normally I always have some random, like here, look, I knew I had one. Like this company over here that's red starts with a W that you may know that also may have had a role. They sent me a credit card <laughs> offer not too long ago. It's like, we get constantly thrown these these offers like, hey, apply for this credit card, pre-approval, da 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 and Or when we go to our favorite stores, it's like, hey, here's your Costco membership card. You need to get the, and that's your membership card, but I think Costco has its own credit card. Amazon has their own credit card. Oh, there's like credit for cards for, I used to work at K Jewelers and they would try to, I want to say oh, yeah. force us to try to get customers, but they encourage. were encourage and, and strongly <laughs> encourage a little nudge, right? Yes. People to get the K card and not to knock any of those companies, but it's like, there's so much credit thrown at us. And it's like, some of these companies will throw a big limit at you. And for someone that grew up with very humble beginnings and grew up with money, not being around a lot to automatically get access to that. It's like, well, like it's a big, like, okay, I have some money that I can move around with and potentially use. How do we prepare ourselves mentally to even get these credit cards so that we don't become, you know, in, in, in big credit card debt and start damaging our score? Well, the first thing I would say is if you're going to borrow on credit, don't just make sure you can make the payment because on a credit card, usually that means it's going to take you 22 or 23 years to pay off that debt. So you want to look at it and go, okay, how long will it take me to pay this off the way things are right now. Not, hey, I'm going to make more money so I'll be able to pay it because you can't bank on it if it hasn't happened yet. But if you can look at it and go, okay, let's say, for example, you're going to borrow $5,000 on a credit card for something, whether it's an engagement ring or for some marketing program for business or whatever it is. You go, okay, how long is it going to take me to pay this off? And you go, okay, I'm going to pay some interest on it if it's that much for most people, right? Most people aren't just going to write a check for five grand. So you have this plan going in and you go, okay, now I have to stick to this plan. Let's say your plan is I'm going to pay this off in 12 months. And you go, okay, so $5,000 over 12 months, figure out that amount, add the annual interest. So let's say they're charging you 20% in interest. Well, 20% of 5,000 is $1,000. So now you're going to pay 6,000. If you pay that over 12 months, that's $500 a month. You'll actually pay it off a little bit faster because as you pay it down, the interest will decrease unless the Fed keeps raising the interest rates. <laughs> then, then, well, maybe it won't. But the main thing is that having that plan going in. And another thing is that if they throw you this card with like this big limit, they go, okay, you've never had a credit card with over a $1,000 limit. And all of a sudden somebody says, we'll give you 20000 limit. Don't think of it as a blank check because you have to pay back whatever you borrow. And so you go, okay, 20,000 limit is awesome to have because then that means if you're going to use your credit, you can still have your credit score up high where you want it without, you know, just destroying everything. So you're going to spend 5,000, you got a $5,000 credit card, your credit score is probably going to be in the low 600s. But if assuming everything else is equal, but if you have a $20,000 credit card and you owe 5000 
it's not going to hurt you because you're only at 25% of your usage, which is good. Anything under 30% is considered really good. So then let me ask you, right? For So this is what happened to me. So I applied for my first Chase card, which was my second credit card, about six or seven months after I applied for the Bank of America one. And then this is around the Christmas season. I think it was like spend $500 in the first like three months or so. And you get like $100 cash back or $100 worth of points uh, back from hitting the welcome. Bonus. And so it was Christmas season and I kind of got carried away. So for me, it wasn't one big lump sum. It was a bunch of little things that I didn't account for that right. added up a lot quicker than I expected. So like, how does one prevent for that stuff? Cause that's what I feel like normally is like the case is like, Hey, I got this card. I could spend a little bit more frivolously. I, I can swipe a little bit more. Oh, I forgot my wallet tap. Or I forgot my cash tap and you just start tapping and paying wherever you go. Now, We've all been there. Prepare, <laughs> how does one prepare for that? So like, cause that's usually is the things that we don't expect that add up a lot quicker than we realize. Right. Well, it's, it's like going to Target or Walmart, you know, everything's cheap. Yeah. So you just keep grabbing more and more stuff. And then pretty soon it's like $500 and you're like, well, that didn't seem cheap at all. <laughs> yeah. So, so the key on credit cards is to know what your balance is. And if it's something you normally pay cash for and you go, oh, I didn't bring my, my cash or I didn't bring my debit card. And when you go home, you go, okay, well, I'm just going to pay that amount on my card right now. And that's yeah. the beauty of all this, being able to access all your accounts online is you can do that. And I've done that before. It's like, and that's a good way to build up points too. You go, okay, well, I'm going to spend, let's say you're going to spend $800 on a, a TV, right? Not a big one, yeah. obviously, because they're like two, three grand now. Let's say you spent $800 on a TV and you can pay cash for it, but you want the points. You know, you want to get that cash back or whatever the bonus there is. So you just go and you use your card and then you go home either that day or the next day and you just pay $800. Yeah. That's something that I tend to do often. If either what I do is I'll pay it off right after or I pay it off in the middle of the month and then at the end of the month and kind of make two payments. Whereas like the first, I'll knock out everything I paid in the first half. And then at the end of the month, I'll pay out everything I did in the second half. That way I still make sure everything is kind of like still taken care of, but I'll have to like have like a, a monitor on every little expense right. that I, I put on the card. So that's kind of been like my healthy balance, but definitely is like paying it off and not waiting to the end of the month to pay it off as well. Like if you can get it right. taken care of sooner, just take care of sooner so you can pretty much have it not be something that you're worried about. And worst case scenario, one thing I always do on all my cards is have, I have automatic payments on. So yep. worst case scenario, like, let's say, I don't know, I lost my phone in like Aruba or something and I have no access to internet. I'm stranded. I know at the very least my card will be paid so that I don't miss any payments ever. Cause that is the worst thing. If I'm not mistaken, correct me wrong, that you could do to your credit is have a late payment or a, a bad payment uh, screw up. Cause if I'm not mistaken, Absolutely. Credit, history, credit history is what? 35% of your yeah. credit report. So uh, yeah. And one late payment you. can drop your score a hundred points in some cases. I've seen it. Jeez. It's like. A hundred points. Like I had a guy tell me, it's like, yeah, this is like back in 08. He was, he's telling me, yeah, I can't afford this house anymore. His income dropped too. He was in the mortgage industry and yeah. he had this huge, nice house. He's, he's like one mortgage payment. My score dropped over a hundred points, <laughs> you know? Jeez. And it, it, yeah. it goes down a lot quicker than it comes back up. Yes, it's yeah, true. So let me, let me ask you now, now that we're on the topic of like score, how does one keep track of your score? Because I know like a lot of these different scores, like to get a little technical, like some have your Vantage score, some have the actual FICO score, some are kind of like usually the credit bureaus are delayed. So like how do we keep an accurate estimate as to what our score is so that we're in the know and we can have an, an idea? Well, there are a couple of things to know about this. Number one, you're right. Vantage score is not the same as FICO. And they'll tell you that only that 10% of, retailers or, or lenders are using the Vantage score now. I don't know of any, but there must be some because it exists. But it's a different scoring model. And even with that 10%, that means 90% are using the FICO score. So hmm. you want to know what your FICO score is. But the problem is there's so many different FICO scores. Yeah. Like you go on Experian and they show you FICO score 8. You apply for a mortgage, they're looking up FICO score 5. And each credit bureau has their own different things are slightly altered. And so what I do is I check my Experian pretty regularly because then I, it gives me an idea. It's not going to tell me what my score is going to be if, when I, if I apply for a car loan or a mortgage or a new credit card. But it tells me what's on my report and it tells me 
if there's something that I've missed, or it gives me a, a pretty good idea of what my score is. Like if you have any identity theft, somebody swiped one of your cards or something and charged, this actually happened to me a few years ago. I got a call from my credit union. They say, yeah, there's, there's this charge like $600. And I'm like, what, what is this? It was like a women's online boot sale. And I'm like, I did not buy women's boots online, I swear. So, so they canceled it out and they had to send me a new card. But what if they hadn't caught that? Yeah. And I didn't know. And then you're, if you're not paying attention, you're paying that and somebody else is still charging stuff up on your card. You know, so, so let me keep, ask you. Yeah. Let me ask you really quickly. To, but, but you mentioned like FICO 8, 5, Vantage. What, what kind of is the difference? I just know of them. I just like I'm aware of like I know that there's different score and they're modeled differently, but like how did advantage score come into play? I know it's a lot newer. Like what's the difference? Why was it even created? I don't know if but I like, I do. What's the difference between oh you do so like a fire away? Because <laughs> this is something I'm I'm actually okay. curious about because I've never heard it. Okay, so FICO is Fair Isaac Company and they've created the credit scores like like back in the early nineties. Before that there were there were not scores. It was just you just had your credit report with whatever was on it. And originally, the credit scores were designed to predict the likelihood that you would have a 90-day late payment within the next two years. And of course, it's changed completely from then. Now it's like, okay, what's this guy score? Does he qualify? That kind of thing. And so all three of the credit bureaus, Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion, they've been buying from FICO, from Fair Isaac. Well, they all got together and they said, well, let's create our own credit score. And that's what the Vantage score is, is those three companies coming together and creating their own scoring model. And a couple of differences you'll see between these is on, like on FICO, let's say you've got $15,000 in credit card debt and you've got $20,000 owed. Well, you're using 75%, so your score is going to be lower. On FICO, you pay all that off and next month, or maybe the month after that, depending on when these lenders actually report to the bureaus, your score is now way back up where you want it. But yeah. on Vantage, what they do is they take the last several months and they look back like a year or two and they go, oh, what's this guy's history of credit usage? And so when you pay off all your debts like that, it doesn't result in an immediate imp improvement in your scores. So that's that's and, a big difference, number one. Yeah. And then big, big difference, number two, is actually within the FICO scores. FICO 8, that's what they give you as the public, right? Yeah. And that's the one where they tell you, yeah, put your uh, your rent payment, put your uh, utilities and all the, your Netflix and all this, put it on there and it'll increase your score. Well, that's all well and good. But the problem is when you apply for a mortgage, that stuff makes no difference at all. It doesn't even count. So it's basically just a PR thing, you know, but in a couple of years, it actually will count. I want to ask you about that too. And that's where I was going to go next. So I heard that they're working now to change like the whole like credit scoring system. And the one that we currently know are, is pretty much going to go like to the dump and they're going to create like a new one for everyone that encounters like uh, that counts in stuff like rent and things like that. Like every day, month, like monthly expect expenses that our consumers pay. Is that true? Is there some truth behind it? Where truth. is it projected? Okay. So where, so, where is it projected? So, at this point, it doesn't look like they're going to scrap the system. They're going to just going to change it. It's always evolving. Yeah. I mean, it, like, you know, right now you pull somebody's credit, you don't even see some of the old stuff that you used to see. It doesn't even show up like tax liens. They used to be on your credit report. Now they're not on your credit report. And mm -hmm. like medical collections, once you pay a medical collection, it has no impact on your score where it used to, even after it was paid, it was treated like any other collection account. And so, these little variations are happening all the time. And this is one that's been talked about from governmental levels saying, okay, this, we want this to change. And so that is going to change. They're going to start counting those things. The, mm -hmm. the problem I see with that is that lenders are wise to it, you know, because they're, they're not stupid. I mean, these guys don't have billions of dollars to lend by being stupid. And so what they're going to look at is they're going to say, okay, this guy's reporting his rent. He's reporting his water bill, but he's not reporting his electric bill. And he's not reporting his phone bill and all these other things. So those might have some late payments on them. So prove it. Now they're going to ask you to prove those too. So it mm -hmm. may be a situation where they want to put everything on there or nothing on there. 
and it could be up to the individual. It could be up to the lender. I don't know. Yeah, so it's exciting. It's not exciting. It's interesting, interesting <laughs> to see where things are going to play. Because that could leave self into like privacy issues very quickly if you just yes. start throwing throwing everything on there. Like, hey, you have to put your car payment, your credit card, your phone, your child support, your this, your that, yeah. your whatever it is. Like, and it's like, oh well, well I, I just want to buy a house i don't want you to know my whole personal history like that's right that's right <laughs> so you don't deserve to know what health club the guy goes to or <laughs> where where he's going to dinner <laughs> that's that's none of his business exactly, none of their business. Right. exactly so that's going to be interesting to see where it all plays out and so let me ask you right because we kind of talked about a lot of topics but the fico score where can we go to actually check it check out our, our official fico score and is does that even matter is it can are we safe to just kind of go around Unless we're making a big, big like purchase, like a house, are we just kind of good to just go around checking our credit karma score or our experience score? Or yeah. How often should we check our official FICO? Well, I, first of all, I would say I wouldn't waste time checking on credit karma because that's the Vantage score and 90% of the lenders aren't going to use it. So, I mean, you can, it's not a horrible thing to check, but it's not going to give yeah. you the same score they're looking at. And I would really, really recommend check every one to two months. Every month, if you can, check on Experian. And again, it's it's not going to give you the credit score that is going to be used if you apply for a car loan or a mortgage or a credit card. And you can't get those as a consumer unless those mm-hmm. lenders are willing to give them to you. Like when I pull somebody's credit, I do a loan for them, I'll give them a copy of their credit report. But most people won't. Like these banks, they don't allow their people to send out their credit report. You go, nope. And I'll do it. I mean, obviously, they have to pay for the credit report first because it costs us money to pull credit. Yeah. You know, just kind of like, yeah, apply for a loan, get a free credit report, and then we give it out to them, and then they go somewhere else. You know? <laughs> we, we're left holding the bill, you know? And so let me ask you, when it comes to credit report, there's a couple of things that I know, like LexisNexis, and there's another one that I forget that like, kind of holds all these information, like everyone's like personal information. Now, how can we kind of like protect our personal information so that no one is trying to apply for new lines of credit under our names? Well, you can actually lock your credit reports with all three credit bureaus so that nobody can pull your credit until you unlock it for them. And so if you're worried about identity theft or if you've had it happen to you before, Mm -hmm. or if you've had it happen to you multiple times before, then it's it's really a good idea to lock those because it's it's not hard to lock it. It's not hard to unlock it. Yeah. I think you can just do it all right online with the credit bureaus. And if you can't do it, I've never done it myself, but if you can't do it online, then you go to the websites and just search and they'll tell you how to do it. Yeah, definitely. It's something that I did. I did it on, I know Experian, Experian is a weird company because they try to make you pay to like to get the Experian like boost or something like that. I forget what they call it. Yeah, yeah. That, like, that's, that's where you like put all your utilities and your cell phone bill yeah, they don't and stuff tell you on like, there. Yeah, when you take your stuff off, it's like that that technically counts because like now if you're reporting that stuff and if you were to take it off, it's like almost essentially the same thing as the closing a credit card essentially. And so it's like that's how they kind of get people. It's like, oh, it sounds good. It reports your credit. It'll boost your score. And then it's like you you stop reporting that stuff and then it's like your score tanks and now you're pretty much left in the dust because no one ever reads the fine print. So uh, right. they, they get a lot of consumers with the, the tricky marketing tactics. So definitely stay aware of all the like little gimmicks that a lot of these companies use to try to get you to do like the boost and whatever the stuff is like, usually if it's too good to be true, I'd it say is. how is this, <laughs> especially in the credit world, it usually is too good to be true. So stay away from it for the most part. Yeah. Um, well, and, and experience boot, you know, as, as we've already discussed, that's where you're adding these things on it. It makes no difference to the creditors that you're going to be applying for now. So I would say yeah. if you're going to start doing that, wait until like, December of this year and then start adding those things in because then a year later you'll have that history and it's going to actually have an effect on it. But if you've already got good credit or you've got enough accounts, you know how to build your credit properly, that stuff's unnecessary. Yeah. Because why add extra work if you don't need to? Definitely. Definitely. Let me ask you another question on a separate topic. What's your thoughts on authorized users? I kind of want to get your thoughts on this because I love something. (laughs) Yeah. But here's, yeah. There's a way to do it right. So when when you're trying to build credit, particularly as a young adult, you're trying to build credit, if you can be added on to a parent or an aunt or an uncle or a grandparent, somebody you're close to that you trust and that trust you, 
if you can be added onto one of their cards as an authorized user, you automatically get their entire credit history on that card. So if they've had that card for 30 years and you're 20 years old, you've got 30 years of credit history, which sounds impossible, but it factors into your score that way, which is really cool. But there are companies out there that sell authorized user lines. And so you pay, I talked to somebody recently, they paid like three grand to be added as an authorized user onto somebody's card for three months so they could get a mortgage. And I went, well, that's just stupid. I mean, you don't know the person that you're being put on their card. You know, they have to have your social security number to add you onto their card. And it's just a matter of time before some of these turn into identity theft problems. Yeah. So let me ask you, what are some of the cons when it comes to authorized users? What if like the person who you're an authorized user on, like misses a payment one month. Well, then you get that too. But the beauty of it is you can remove that completely. You can remove the account. Like let's say you get, as an authorized user, you get added onto your parents' account, right? And they've got perfect credit history and then something happens and a payment gets missed. Yeah. But in the meantime, you've used that account and that credit score to build up your own credit. Because ideally, that's the way you want to do it. You don't want to just get authorized user and that's your only account. Because lenders will look at that and go, you, you don't even have any of your own accounts. You're just an authorized user. Yeah. So you want, to, you want to use that as a stepping stone to get your own accounts. And so mm -hmm. once you've got your own accounts, if they have a misstep, or let's say they charge it up all the way, and now it's at the limit, and their credit limit is higher than any of your cards, and so now your usage is 80%, you're like, oh, no, what am I going to do? Get removed from it. Yeah, you just you just say I want to be removed from this card. You could actually call the company and say I want to be removed from this card, and they'll remove you. And now you're not an authorized user, and it gets completely removed from your credit report. That's some solid advice, and Todd, you've been dropping a bunch of gems throughout this entire episode, and some good comedic lines as well. <laughs> Where can we find you? Where can we connect with you if we wanted to learn more about what you have going on in your world? You can go to my website, ToddWilson.pro. So Todd with two D's, so T O D D W I L S O N dot P R O. Amazing. And so now it's time for our famous five questions, the question we ask every single guest, rapid fire round. Question number one, what is the most impactful lesson that you've learned in life? Wow. Most impactful lesson I've learned in my entire life? Yeah. <laughs> I would have to say it happened when I first joined the swim team as a kid because my mom made my brother and me both join the team at the same time. And we didn't want to. And we were both terrible swimmers at the time. And my brother just, he was just mad about it and didn't work. And I went, okay, I'm here. I'm going to give it my shot because I, I hate to lose, right? Yeah. And so I worked hard and I got good at swimming. And that's kind of stuck with me. That, that work ethic has stuck with me my entire life. It's the a prime example of the half full, half empty cup analogy, right? Yes, absolutely. I was like, ah, screw it. I don't want to do this. And you were like, man, if I'm, I'm going to be here, I might as well get good at it, right? That's exactly right. All right. What is the most admirable trait a person can have? Most admirable? Wow. I don't know. That, that's tough to narrow down to a single one. But I guess I, if I had to narrow down to one, I have to say honesty. But I have to qualify it with honesty is not just telling the truth but actually having truly good intentions because there are people that are honest, but brutally honest. And that's not <laughs> a good trait because the whole, the whole goal should be to uplift those in your environment. People you talk to every day. I mean, like you go into buy a sandwich at a deli, you smile, you say hello and thank you. And you know, you chat with them and they feel good because you were there. Mm -hmm. That's part of honesty because you, know, you really are there to help people. Yeah, definitely. If you had to change someone's life with one book, which book would you recommend? One book? Man, that's not fair. <laughs> that's not fair. I mean, it kind of depends on what areas they're looking to change. But, yeah, I mean, I, this might sound a little bit self-serving or conceited, but honestly, my book, Crack the Credit Code, can change people's lives in a huge way because it's not something that's taught in schools because the teachers don't know it either. And I put it together in a way that, you could pick that book up if you know practically nothing about credit and read it and understand it. And that was really the intention when I wrote it. But even if you have good credit, you can still learn something from that book. What is the legacy that you're trying to leave behind? I want to change the way people look at credit. 
I want credit to be taken from a problem to a solution. And for anyone that wants to embark on their walk to wealth, what is the first step that they should take? Oh, man, that's another tough one. Those are good <laughs> questions. <laughs> so the first step, huh? Well, I think the first step is really commit. I mean, you have to commit because there are going to be barriers that you are going to run into. I mean, when we started our private money lending company in 2007, I mean, huge barriers. If I had not, if I had known, I may not have pushed through it, but there was a lot to push through. Yeah. I mean, not getting paid for the first eight months was brutal, especially when I got a family at home. I'm like, I don't know how I did it, but pushing through and just being persistent, having that commitment to success and that commitment to figure a way out and find out whatever knowledge you need to have to make it work. Yeah, there's a quote I literally seen a couple of days ago from the time of recording. It's don't lower your goals to your current reality, raise your skills to get to to become who you need to become in order to achieve the goal. Right? That's and awesome. So like, I seen it on Instagram. I had to repost it. So I think it already came down from my story, but it'll be long gone by the time because <laughs> Instagram stories only last 24 hours. But Todd, as you know what they say, all good things must come to an end. It was a pleasure having you on the show. It was great to chat with someone who's also big into credit and knows about it and just kind of bounce ideas and see your perspective on everything. And I definitely know that I took a couple of things away, especially with the Vantage Core stuff. So I know like anyone listening definitely will be, have a lot to take away from this episode. So thanks again for hopping on. Well, thank you for having me on. It was great.